Good morning. I'm glad you could join us this morning. We're going to go through several different things this morning in, ab in the absence of having an opportunity to be together. And uh, hopefully at the end of this, we'll be able to talk together via the chat. We'll talk, talk about that just a little bit more here in a second. I want to give you a few announcements. <clears throat> we are respecting the CDC guidelines uh, and the governor's orders uh, for us to refrain from gatherings over 10 and stay away from that. Uh, that's in place until April 18th, which is 30 days from last Thursday when they put that order into effect. Now, that means we're not going to be holding any in-person services or activities until that date, until April 18th. Uh, we're scheduled to have Kent and Berlin Albright with us that weekend, and we're planning on meeting for Iron Men and Daughters of the King on that Saturday, April 18th, and they'll be speaking. And then they'll be with us the next day, Sunday, the 19th, as well, and we'll be sharing what, what God has been doing in their ministry. So that'll be kind of a fun way for us to get back together, is to have our, our, our missionaries that we have sent out, uh, Kent and Boleyn, with us on that weekend. Be praying about that. We'd really like for us to be able to get back together by that time. That'll be a full month away. And, uh, and we don't want to be away any longer than that if we can if we can help it. Now, when this online sermon that we're about to do is done, we're going to open up, uh, up open up WhatsApp, our chat room. This is a new endeavor, and it's undoubtedly going to have some bugs uh, that we're going to have to work out. So, on your phone, if you haven't already done this, go to the Play Store or what, however you get apps on your phone. And download WhatsApp, that's spelled W-H-A-T-S-A-P-P. And we are what's called the RHBC Church Chat. Um, I've tried to invite uh, as many of you as I possibly can uh, on my phone. And we're going to try to get everybody hooked up as, as best we can. But that's how we're going to be doing this. My plan is that we would be uh, listening to this message and these, the, the, the announcements and so forth, um, between 10.30 and about 11.15, and then open up the chat room around 11.15 and uh, enjoy each other's company for a little while. One more item I want to mention before we get into our scripture reading and prayer and then into our message, and that is that my phone number in the church directory is incorrect. It should be 719-310-6612. That's 6612. So if you'd make a note of that and correct it in your uh, copy of the directory, I'd appreciate that. We're going to turn our attention to the scriptures. <clears throat> the message this morning is entitled Accountable. It's the, uh, the, the 11th message in our Growing Strong Together series. We're staying with our series in spite of the fact that we're uh, separated as a result of the uh, coronavirus and so forth. We're staying with our series. And so this is message number 11. It's uh, entitled Accountable. And the key passage in this has to do with church discipline from 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So I want to read the entire chapter for you. This is again from the New King James Version. And uh, we'll start with verse 1 and read down through verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 1. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. And you are puffed up, and you have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from you. For I indeed, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged, as though I were present, him who has done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such an one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread 
of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging those who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. Let's pray together. Father, you are holy. You are completely separate from sin and completely focused on what is right and good and wholesome. You have also encouraged us to be holy. holy. You said in a number of places, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, be holy, for I am holy. One of those places would be 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. You want us to live lives that mirror your own, as much as is possible in our fallen world. But we sin. We sin a lot. And sometimes we sin with impunity. Give us wisdom as we consider the remedy that Jesus offered. Father, we pray about this ongoing virus situation that has caused so much sickness, death, and panic. The impact has expanded, and some in our church family have potentially been exposed. So we pray for safety in the midst of sickness. We pray for wisdom in the midst of a lot of uncertainty. And most important, we pray for boldness to be a witness to the grace of God and the love of Christ in the midst of all of this fear. Father, we want to bring Jim and Janice Mitchell before you. We're grateful for their ministry up there in northern Colorado in the Fort Collins area, and I pray that you would give them wisdom uh, as they navigate these same issues with us. and Give them power as they uh, present the gospel to people up there and that, that uh, people would see Christ in them and would see the importance of, uh, of responding to that ministry. We also pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ at Calvary Community Baptist Church up in North Glen. And pray for Pastor uh, Redlin, uh, Pastor Rob, and his wife Barbara, and would ask that you would minister to them and through them uh, in, in the midst of this. Uh, you know, undoubtedly, they are not meeting today, but I pray that you'll help them to have a witness and, uh, and an impact through their church in spite of the fact that they're not together. Pray for J.L. Clark this morning. I would ask that you would bless her as she studies toward missions and prepares for that ministry. And I pray for our president, Donald Trump, and for our vice president, Mike Pence. They have the weight of the world literally on their shoulders right now. And I pray that you'll give them wisdom and that you'll guide their thoughts and their steps, <clears throat> help them to make good decisions, help them, Father, to be... Um, effective servants of yours. You've said in your word that they are your servants, and I pray, Father, that you'll help them to be effective. Pray for our governor in the same way, for Jared Polis, and I would ask that you'd give him wisdom. Help him to know what steps to take. Help him to have a good balance that says, I'm interested in protecting the safety of our people, but I don't want to hurt their liberty. Help him to have that balance. We pray for our mayor, John Southers, as he navigates these things here in Colorado Springs and for our city and county first responders who have such tremendous responsibilities in all of this. And then, Father, we pray for our city council president, Richard Scorman, and for our county commissioner, Mark Waller, and would ask that you would bless them as well in the, the activities that they're involved with and in leading us here in our local area. And now, Father, we ask you to teach us from your word how you would have us hold each other accountable. We don't want to do this in a judgmental fashion. We want to speak the truth in love and lift each other up when we fall. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The message this morning, as I said, is entitled Accountable. And our thought that we want to focus on is a healthy church will practice biblical 
church discipline. The trend among churches today is to make Christianity as acceptable and non-judgmental as possible. So pastors try to, to avoid the use of the S and H words, that would be sin and hell, and focus on the love of God and the grace of God. We don't even want to talk about his mercy because that implies that we've done something wrong and it requires a merciful response. The thinking behind this in our postmodern times is that we can't confront sin if we're going to attract a crowd. Everything has to be positive. No thought of God's wrath or his judgment is welcome because that will scare people away, and we don't want to do that. So since we won't even allow God to stand against us, there is a really strong aversion to any kind of confrontation between believers. The Church of Jesus Christ in the 21st century has adopted the mantra of the Los Angeles riots from a few years back. Can't we all just get along? Peace and unity are the watchwords. The idea that someone in the church would confront another one over offense or sin is unwelcome. It's, also, it's, it's just considered a breach of etiquette. In addition, church members aren't going to sit still for that. The public humiliation of church censure, never mind whether it's warranted or not, is just not acceptable may even be grounds for legal action if the member isn't sensed enough. But you know what? The Bible is a stubborn book. The Holy Spirit isn't moved by modern trends to change what he has written. And the scriptures speak to the issue of discipline in a number of places. If our church is going to be healthy, we've got to consider the scriptural teaching on church discipline and submit ourselves to the absolute authority of the Word of God. Because a healthy church will practice biblical church discipline. It will. This morning I want us to consider three thoughts here. The pattern for exercising church discipline, which is found in Matthew 18. The practice of church discipline, which we read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and the result of that effort in 2 Corinthians 2. And then the purposes for church discipline, which are found in 1 Corinthians 5 and 2 Corinthians 2, along with Galatians chapter 1. So let's start with the pattern for church discipline in Matthew 18. If you have your Bibles, you can open the, your Bibles to that passage, Matthew chapter 18. And we'll be looking at verses 15 to 17. You can turn there with me if you'd like. Um, you might be watching this on your phone, so it might be difficult to watch this and turn on your phone at the same time, but if you figured out how to do that, more power to you. Matthew chapter 18 and verses 15 to 17. And that passage says, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. There's a clear pattern for confronting open sin in the church, and it's given to us here in Matthew chapter 18. If we were to follow this pattern, instead of trying to invent something new and better, we'd be a lot better off in our personal and local church relationships. That's why Jesus gave it to us, because it, be, it would be better. The pattern is actually fourfold, and it begins with a private conversation. When sin becomes known, we have the responsibility to confront it lovingly between believers. That word lovingly is important. We don't do this out of judgmentalism. We don't, we don't do this in a, in a manner that says a gotcha. Instead, we need to love each other through this. There's no mandate to go in a haughty, self-righteous manner. And there's, pardon me, there's no allowance for spiritual pride in Scripture. None, anywhere, especially not in this kind of setting. However, when we know something is wrong, we do have a mandate to confront sin. Why? Why do we have to do that? Isn't that hurtful? Well, we need to do it because we're children of a holy God. And he has commanded us to be holy as well, individually and as collectively as a church. 
He's also commanded us to love one another, which means we want what is best for our fellow believers. Now, that's not what's sometimes referred to as sloppy agape, where we condone anything in an effort to keep the peace. It's tough love, where we do what is right in the best interest of our brothers in Christ. That means when we see something that's wrong, we carefully and lovingly confront the problem head on. That's Christian love. The first step in this process is to go privately and see if the problem can be resolved one-on-one. -on -one. In love, we lay out the issue and encourage repentance on the part of our erring brother or sister. If our Christian brother confesses and turns from his sin, then the matter's closed, and we've won a wonderful victory over sin and over Satan, and it doesn't have to go any farther than that. Unhappily, human nature being what it is, the person who has sinned sometimes doesn't want to admit wrong, particularly in a one-on-one -on -one setting. Sometimes it turns into a he said, she said kind of argument. And, and we just find ways to justify our actions if we so choose. So if the first step doesn't work, then there is a second step that sometimes needs to come into play. And that second step is to confront sin with witnesses. It's interesting that throughout the Bible, Scripture places a high premium on witnesses. In our passage, Matthew quotes two verses in Deuteronomy that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Now the setting is still private. Nothing has been publicly announced at this point, but it now involves others who know about the matter. So the idea is that this removes that he said, she said nature of the argument. It's no longer one person's word against the word of another. The confirmation of truth in the matter will often lead to repentance because the excuse that it may just be one person's viewpoint melts away when there are witnesses. However, <laughs> human nature being what it is, people will sometimes ignore the impact of multiple witnesses and continue in the sin. Sometimes they'll even agree that there is sin present, but will be unwilling to take the necessary steps to confess and forsake it. In any event, if the sep second step works, fine, the matter can stop there. The person has recognized his sin, he's confessed his sin, it doesn't have to go any farther than that, those two or three witnesses. However, if it doesn't, there is a third step. In the third step, the sin is now made a matter of public record. The congregation as a whole is brought into the process and the sinning brother is confronted publicly. The purpose of this is to drive home the serious nature of the sin. You know, in our culture today, sin is oftentimes a laughing matter. People just laugh it off and just talk about it as if it's no big deal. But the purpose of this step is to say it's not a laughing matter. And it's not simply going to blow over. God's people as a local assembly are seeking to reconcile a wayward and stubborn brother or sister in Christ. So if our brother sees the light at this stage, he can be restored and the church can be moved can can move forward. Now you would hope he would see the light in the first stage or may, at, at the most the second stage. You really don't want to bring it to the whole church if you can help it. But if he will be open to confessing his sin at this point, things can move forward. He can be restored and and the fellowship doesn't have to be broken. If, however, he still refuses to repent, there's only one more step. And the final step is to remove sin from the church. It's to let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Now, let me be careful to say, the idea is not to shun or to treat him poorly. Because even if you have to go through this step, our ultimate goal is still restoration. That's the last thing we would want to do is to, to, to treat him poorly. No, the idea is to turn him out of the fellowship of the, of the local body. With respect to our church fellowship and membership, we are to consider him as if he were unsaved. Now, Paul's thoughts to the Thessalonians with respect to wayward brothers are helpful. He tells us, yet in 2 
2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 15. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. The whole shunning idea leads to the first half of that verse. You count him as an enemy. He has been a part of the body, and now we shun him, and now we tell him, you can't have any part of us. And you're, you're an anathema, you're a blot. And, and you make them feel as bad as they can. That's not the point of this. And Paul tells us so in 2 Thessalonians 3. He tells Timothy to avoid strife and to instruct in meekness to the end that, quote, God will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 to 26. Even in this final stage, we should be seeking the restoration of a wayward or fallen brother. However, the step is clear. Remove the willfully sinning brother from the fellowship of the church until such time as he is willing to confess and forsake his sin. At that point, 2 Corinthians 2, he can be reinstated into the church family. Now let me say, this, this passage is widely accepted as the pattern Jesus set up for church discipline. It's just not widely obeyed. The second thing I want you to notice is the practice of church discipline in the passage we read a few moments, well, moments ago in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We're not left with simple theory on this point, as if you look at uh, what Jesus had to say in Matthew and you just say, well, that's the theory and we can't figure out how to do it. Here's how a church was supposed to do it. The Holy Spirit used Paul to show us how this principle played out in a local church setting, in a practical manner. Remember that the city of Corinth was known for its mobile and wicked lifestyle. They had a well-deserved reputation for sensuality and immorality. When we did the uh, series in 1 Corinthians, we noted that even among the Romans, who weren't necessarily a moral people, the phrase Corinthian morals became a commonly used description of a highly immoral society. Out of the city that was given over to idolatry and sensuality, God carved out a church through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. The church was made up, however, of Corinthians. While many were truly redeemed and converted from their former sinful lifestyles and were godly people, some brought the old habits that they had lived with all those years with them into the church. And what su one such man shows up in 1 Corinthians 5. So if you've turned away from it, come back with me to 1 Corinthians 5, and let's take a look at two thoughts that come out of this passage. In verses 1 to 6, the first thing we see is that the church knew about this man's sin, but they weren't doing anything about it. It wasn't a matter of church ignorance. They were well aware. It was a matter of church neglect. And from Paul's perspective, that was no light matter. The man in question was carrying on an immoral relationship with his stepmother. Now, Paul doesn't speak about the church's responsibility toward her. We don't know anything more about her than that he, he was this man's stepmother. But we can conclude that she was probably an unsaved person and probably outside the fellowship of the local church because he doesn't say anything about her. However, the man was not outside the fellowship of the local church. He was apparently a believer, and if the, if the person in 2 Corinthians 2 is the same person as the one we see here in 1 Corinthians 5, and I think, he is, I think that is the same person, um, he was a believer who refused to terminate this relationship, at least at the time that 1 Corinthians was written. So in the first six verses of this chapter, Paul scolds the church. He scolds them because of their attitude toward this man and toward his sin. Instead of mourning, as they should have, and taking steps to discipline the wayward man, they were puffed up, according to verse 2, and glorying, verse 6, what that means is they were proud of this. Apparently, the Corinthian culture was a lot like ours today, and they valued tolerance. And the church had become infected with that set of values. We don't have 
a high and mighty attitude toward this guy. If he wants to have that kind of a relationship with his stepmother, that's up to him. We're tolerant people. In fact, they considered themselves praiseworthy for their attitude of tolerance toward this wayward brother. But Paul saw it very differently. He saw their tolerance as neglect of a biblical mandate to keep the church pure and to discipline wayward brothers. So what the first thing we see in this passage is that it was neglected. That, that this concept of, of uh, church discipline was neglected. But then you see, in, in starting in chapter 7, or verse 7, I should say, and working down through verse 13, Paul commands them, therefore purge out the old leaven. He's not telling them to get rid of sinners in the world. You can't do that. you got to leave them to God, chapter uh, or verses 9, 10, and 13. Instead, he's telling them to dissociate, to step away from willfully sinful people who are inside the church. That's verses 11 and 12. The phrase, not to keep company, is a compound word used here and in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 14. And it means to mingle together with someone. And in this case, it's in the negative. Avoid mingling with the willful sinner. Avoid that kind of close familial relationship that should characterize brothers and sisters in Christ. You treat him as if he were not a member of the family of God. Paul's hope is that the wayward brother will suffer judgment that will lead him to repent and be restored, according to verse 5. Now again, it's worth noting that in the second epistle to the Corinthians, there is a passage in chapter 2 that seems to refer to the end result of this action. And what it's saying is it worked. The brother sensed his guilt and repented. So Paul counseled them to receive him back into their fellowship so that he would not be swallowed up, is the phrase in the New King James, swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Think of that, folks. This man was guilty of participating in an incestuous relationship with his stepmother. But when he repented, Paul said, take him back. He shouldn't be left on the outside. Yeah, his sin was not good. It was something that even the Gentiles would uh, probably look at and say, well, that's pretty gross. But when he repented, Paul said, take him back. Okay, so why do we do this? What are the purposes of church discipline? What's the point of all of this? Well, first, it results in a clean church. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we won't turn to all these passages, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, and verses 11 to 13, Paul tells the church to purge out the old leaven, get rid of the sin, and participate in worship from the perspective of sincerity and truth. <clears throat> a church that harbors known sin is in trouble. It has already irritated the Lord. And you can see that in Revelation 2, with the church at Pergamos and the church at Thyatira. And it'll lose its effectiveness if that's the case. You wonder why a lot of churches today are not effective, that they don't stand and, and have an impact for Christ. A lot of times it's because there is sin in the ranks that's not been dealt with. The story of Israel and Achan in Joshua 7 is a sobering example of the importance God places on purity within the congregation of his people. So one of the purposes of church discipline is a pure church. Now as an aside, this has the side benefit of cleansing the church and making it healthy. When you purge out the poison, the, the body is restored to health. But while the poison remains, the entire body suffers. <clears throat> That's the first purpose. The second purpose is that it leads to a contrite Christian. And again, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verses 1 through 11 talk about this, the, the end result of this situation. And Galatians 6 1 comes into play here. It's to bring the wayward believer back into a right relationship with God. Now, we've also seen that this was the outcome in the Corinthian situation, and, and we've seen that God desires it in the pattern that he set up. Now, Paul admonished the Galatians with respect to this kind of thing as well. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, here's what it says. 
Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, and in, in the regular King James it says overtaken in a fault, you who are spiritual, restore such a one to a spirit of gentleness, in a spirit of gentleness, pardon me, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. And then he goes on in verse 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And the bear one another's burdens doesn't mean doesn't mean that you like like you take on their financial challenges. It means that you bear their sin. Not that you sin as well, but you bear their sin. Considering yourself, he says at the end of verse 1, lest you also be tempted. Be careful, because you could fall into the same kind of sin. So God wants us to restore our fallen brethren, not just leave them to die. It's been said, and it's sadly true, that the Lord's army is the only one that shoots its own wounded. There's a lot of truth in that. In our pursuit of, pursuit of purity, we can lose sight of restoration. And the Corinthians were in danger of doing just that in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 until Paul encouraged them and said, hey, you need to restore your repentant brother. He's, he has done his part. Now you need to do your part. There's a balance in discipline. Obedience to the command to guard the purity of God's church must be balanced with obedience to the command to restore a fallen brother, if at all possible. We need to pursue both of those goals in order to be healthy as a church. Now, as we wrap this up, let me just say there's a question that arises that we've, we've got to answer, and there's not a definitive answer to it, but we've got to at least try. And that question is, what sins constitute grounds for church discipline? As I said, there's no definitive list in the Bible, but several stand out, several types of sins stand out because they are singled out. One is right here in 1 Corinthians 5, and that's sexual sin. Another is a divisive spirit. That's an interesting one in Romans chapter 16 and verse 17. Still another is the promotion of false doctrine. Uh, Paul counsels Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 to 5, that you cannot allow that to stay in the church. And finally, there is the sin of sloth and disobedience to the truth in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 to 15. So there's four sins right there that could very well be uh, in the category of church discipline. Just the same, Scripture doesn't limit discipline to those items. There could be some other things that would come up as well. As well. And let, me, let, me, let me just throw this out that as, a, as a helper. Where sin begins to impact a church, that church must be ready to take biblical action. When sin in a camp is wrecking a church's ministry or hindering a church's ministry, the church has to be ready to take action. Church discipline is critical to church health. So, how are we doing? Are we interested in obedience in this area? Or have we fallen prey to the world's view? Satan preaches tolerance all the time. Just let it go. It's no big deal. Who's it really hurting? Have we succumbed to that kind of thinking? God help us to fight for the purity of the church. And to fight for the souls of our brothers and sisters in Christ who are struggling with sin. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for what, what your word teaches us here. It's not teaching us to be judgmental. Help us not to go in that direction. It would be easy to do so. Instead, it is teaching us to be careful, to be holy, to be accountable. And those are good things. I pray, Father, that you'll help us as a church family to appreciate the value of accountability, to appreciate the importance of holiness, to appreciate the danger of sin, and to act when biblical discipline is called for. Give us wisdom from this. Help us to speak the truth 
in love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.